You're a square no! doing this! No! No! A family going camping with over a million in cash either means there's something wrong with the wife or her husband. As a lawyer, Jimmy knows that this money is embezzled public funds. However, in order to clear Nacho of suspicion and free himself, Jimmy has to get the Kettleman couple to come forward and explain their disappearance to the police. But Betsy worries that if they go back, her husband will go to jail for embezzling funds, so she offers $100,000 to bribe Jimmy to keep quiet. Despite the temptation, Jimmy refuses to cross moral and legal boundaries and makes it clear he will not accept a bribe. But with the Kettleman couple's insistence, Jimmy suggests it could be a retainer fee for hiring him as their lawyer, and he even compliments himself. Hearing this, the Kettleman couple becomes reluctant again. Their reason for refusal is deeply hurtful to Jimmy because, in their eyes, only criminals would hire him to defend them. What? You're the kind of lawyer guilty people hire. Back in the parking lot, Jimmy expresses admiration for Mike's deduction skills, admitting he did find the missing Kettleman family. As a token of his appreciation, Jimmy offered to provide Mike with legal assistance if he needed it. With the Kettleman family found, Nacho's suspicion is also cleared. Jimmy tells Nacho they are now even and will stay out of each other's way. But Nacho still believes Jimmy betrayed him, as the Kettleman couple went camping right after he planned his move, which clearly indicates Jimmy tipped them off. Jimmy denies it, claiming it was just a coincidence. Nacho doesn't buy Jimmy's lie and blames him for causing significant trouble that will come at a great cost. Jimmy, unhappy with this, retorts sharply. How much trouble you caused me? Hey, you didn't need any help getting caught, okay? The neighbor ID'd you. You were sloppy. Any trouble you might have, that's on you. Somebody is who may have warned the Kettleman's got them out of there before you did anything even more stupid. You should be thanking this good Samaritan. Because whoever he is, he did you a favor. He makes a valid point that if the Kettleman family hadn't gone camping, Nacho might have been caught red-handed during his operation. That night, Jimmy returns to his office, but he's still worried because he took the Kettleman couple's money due to his financial struggles and now needs to launder it. Jimmy lists various expenses to account for the money, but with two bundles left, he decides to categorize them as miscellaneous expenses. With money in hand, Jimmy doesn't forget his grudge against Howard to promote his law firm and annoy Howard. Jimmy gets a suit tailored exactly like Howard's and styles his hair to match. The scene shifts to a brand new billboard erected near HHM's office. When Howard found out, he brought Jimmy's best friend Kim to the billboard, and he said that except for his face, everything else was copied from him. Smart Kim knows the boss's purpose is to use her as a messenger to warn Jimmy. Kim is aware of Jimmy and Howard's feud, but placing the billboard on Howard's daily commute route is equivalent to a declaration of war. Jimmy is fully aware of his actions and wants to fight back against Howard because Howard didn't like Jimmy's matchbook ads and reported to Chuck. Jimmy wants to prove to Howard that he is not to be underestimated. He suggested that Kim switch to another firm, believing that with her abilities, she'd have a brighter future elsewhere than at HHM. However, Kim had her own concerns, as HHM sponsored her throughout her bar exam preparation, leaving her indebted to Howard. Jimmy asserted that if Howard disliked the billboard, he should deal with it himself and not use Kim as a pawn. Jimmy was fully prepared and ready to fight at any moment. Seeing no success in persuading Jimmy, Kim could only warn him that this was akin to an egg hitting a rock. He couldn't win against Howard. With that, Kim got up and left. But Kim didn't see Jimmy's true intention. The next day, Jimmy, wearing a suit identical to Howard's, went with Howard to see the prosecutor. After their arguments and Howard presenting evidence, the prosecutor made the decision they both wanted. Jimmy had to take down the billboard within 48 hours. Howard, thinking he had one, didn't realize this was just the first step in Jimmy's plan. Jimmy then moved to the next phase of his plan, contacting various news media to expose how his small firm was being bullied by the large HHM firm. But the story lacked appeal, and after numerous calls, no one was willing to interview him. Fortunately, Jimmy's creativity knew no bounds. Seeing a girl in a University of New Mexico uniform, an idea struck him. In the next scene, Jimmy hired a worker to begin taking down the billboard. He also brought in some film students from the University of New Mexico. As the director and writer, Jimmy instructed the students on filming. Once the camera angles were set, Jimmy began his real performance. I'm James McGill. Like most Americans, I'm a self-made man. I put myself through law school. 
Working in the courts as a public defender, I represented those with nowhere else to turn. Well, I, I scrimped and I saved, and uh, finally I was able to buy one billboard, a tiny foray into advertising for my fledgling law firm. I've always been told that America is the land of opportunity, and I believed it until today. <laughs> Not 24 hours after my billboard went up, a large law firm came after me. They said that I was hurting their business. They're rich, they're powerful, I'm just one man. So who do you think the court sided with? So now, my little billboard comes down. However, during Jimmy's interview, the worker dismantling the billboard accidentally fell and was left hanging in midair. The inexperienced student screamed, pointing at the worker, but Jimmy remained calm, as this was all part of his plan. Then he started his own personal show for the camera. He was going to risk his life to save the worker, and of course the camera was going to record the whole thing. Soon, a crowd gathered. Everything was under Jimmy's control, and in front of everyone, he successfully pulled the worker to safety, naturally. Jimmy also made it to the headlines of the day. With everyone at HHM watching his interview, Howard, not being a fool, saw through Jimmy's show but hadn't anticipated Jimmy's next move. However, whether Howard believed it or not was irrelevant. What mattered was that the ordinary citizens believed it and admired the hero. Kim finally understood Jimmy's real intention, while Howard stormed off in anger, and Kim smiled knowingly. As a result, just as Jimmy had hoped, his law firm finally opened for business. The next morning, Jimmy arrived at his brother Chuck's doorstep. Jimmy picked up the newspaper from the ground, glanced at the front page headline featuring his heroic act, and quickly hid it. If Chuck saw it, he would definitely know it was another one of Jimmy's schemes. As usual, Jimmy first placed his electronic devices in the mailbox. Jimmy brags to Chuck that he got three calls from clients this morning. Chuck outwardly celebrated but wore a surprised expression as he inquired about the source of Jimmy's clients. Jimmy evaded the question, saying he just followed Chuck's advice, and clients naturally came to him. Chuck knew Jimmy well and sensed he was hiding something, so he asked for today's newspaper. Jimmy handed him a stack, but observant Chuck noticed one was missing. Jimmy lied claiming the mailman might have forgotten it or some kids might have taken it. But Chuck grew more suspicious. After Jimmy left, Chuck saw the neighbor's newspaper across the street. To expose Jimmy's lie, Chuck endured the pain from electromagnetic radiation to buy the neighbor's newspaper. Of course, doing so without the neighbor's consent. Unfortunately, the neighbor witnessed this scene. Back home, Chuck immediately opened the newspaper and, as expected, the front page headline was about Jimmy's heroic act. Chuck hurriedly wrapped himself in a space blanket, symbolizing his inner rejection of Jimmy's actions. The episode opens with a flashback to young, sly Jimmy during his con artist days. Jimmy and his friend Marco got hold of many fake Rolex watches, with Jimmy in charge of approaching unsuspecting men like Stevie. When Jimmy and Stevie were walking down the street in the middle of the night, he purposely let Stevie pick up Marco's wallet, which he had thrown away beforehand. The selfish Stevie takes the money in the wallet for himself, and then they run into Marco lying drunk on the ground. Jimmy pretended not to know Marco and snatched the watch off Marco's wrist before walking away. Stevie wanted to see the watch, but Jimmy feigned ignorance and refused to show it. Seeing that Jimmy is easy to bully, Stevie directly snatched the watch. When Stevie discovered it was a Rolex, worth at least $3,000, he quickly offered to trade it with Jimmy. Jimmy feigned reluctance, so Stevie gave him all the money he had and then parted ways with Jimmy, feeling triumphant. Later, sucker! I think that's what Jimmy wanted to say to him. After Stevie left, Marco, who had been pretending to be asleep, immediately got up. Life really is like a play. It all relies on acting skills. This also hinted at Jimmy's plan to use his unique talents to achieve his goals in this episode. However, these cunning tactics were what Chuck disapproved of. Forming the core of the rift between Chuck and Jimmy, he is the world's most embarrassed lawyer. He doesn't have a decent office, so he meets his clients in a cafe. He drives an old, beat-up Suzuki, and he can't even afford a $3 parking fee. Unable to get normal cases, he works as a public defender for criminals. To make matters worse, he's now being targeted by the illegal organization. Through a twist of fate, he lands a huge sum of money. With this infusion of funds, he manages to turn things around and successfully markets himself. 
After a year without any business, his law firm finally gets its first custom case. Ricky's home is a luxurious mansion in the suburbs, with the gate a full kilometer from the house. In the distance, there are fenced-off wooden stakes, indicating that the whole area is his property. Parked at Ricky's house is a military-grade Hummer, making Jimmy's little car look ridiculously small in comparison. Ricky first praises Jimmy for his heroic act of saving a worker on the billboard and then admires his perseverance and hard work. It turns out Jimmy's carefully prepared speech was unnecessary. In Jimmy's advertisement, his speech resonated with Ricky, who was unhappy with the current ruler's oppression of entrepreneurs. Ricky expressed his desire to secede from the United States and build a micronation like the Vatican. Seeing Ricky's ambition, Jimmy realizes this could be a case that lasts for years. The two quickly hit it off. Ricky asks about Jimmy's fees, cleverly. Jimmy pauses to think and, seeing Ricky's extravagance, quotes a rate of $450 per hour. Ricky finds hourly billing cumbersome and instead offers a flat fee of $1 million, with a $500,000 advance payable immediately. Jimmy thinks that's fair, so Ricky goes to get the money. Jimmy is overjoyed but keeps a calm exterior. Ricky returns with a tray full of cash and presents it to his new lawyer, to Jimmy's shock. The faces on the bills are all Ricky's. Tax-free and backed by the full faith and credit of the sovereign Sandia Republic. A bewildered Jimmy checks a few more stacks, only to find the same thing. At that moment, Jimmy had a string of curses running through his mind. He had thought this was a great start, but it turned out to be a joke. The second client was even more bizarre. In order to let his children go to the toilet without any problems, Roland invented a sensor-activated voice-activated toilet. Gosh, you're big. You're so big. My goodness, look at you. Give it to me, Chandler. I want it all. Mm. Ah. Roland thinks his invention is brilliant and wants Jimmy to help him patent it. But Jimmy finds it too suggestive and prone to innuendo. Roland feels his pure intentions are sullied by Jimmy and their discussion quickly falls apart. Jimmy is disappointed, wondering what kind of odd clients he keeps encountering. Despite this, he heads to his third client's home, who is an elderly lady, Mrs. Strauss wants to hire Jimmy to distribute her clay figurines as part of her estate to her children. Jimmy's humor makes Mrs. Strauss laugh heartily. After some jokes, Jimmy quotes a fee of $140, payable in two installments. Mrs. Strauss pulls out her wallet and pays the full amount up front without hesitation. Jimmy finally earns his first payment of the day. In the evening, Jimmy does Kim's nails while sharing stories about the odd client he's met today. Fortunately, Mrs. Strauss trusted him a lot. Kim suggested Jimmy focus on the elderly as a target group, noting they often need legal support. Just as she finished speaking, her boss called to say that something had happened to Chuck and asked if she could find Jimmy. It turned out that morning, because Chuck forcibly bought the neighbor's newspaper. The neighbor had called the police. Seeing that Chuck wouldn't open the door, the police observed through the back window that all the wiring in the house had been removed and there was a large stockpile of portable stove fuel. The police concluded that he was a psychopath and used extreme measures. As a result, Chuck suffered severe allergic reactions due to the intense electromagnetic radiation. When Jimmy arrived at the hospital, his first move was to cut off all the power to the equipment, prompting the nurse to urgently try to stop him. Seeing that she couldn't dissuade Jimmy, the nurse went to get help. Jimmy noticed one light that remained on and decided to remove the bulb directly. Security guards and doctors arrived to intervene. Jimmy explained that the patient had electromagnetic hypersensitivity and all electrical devices needed to be turned off. Kim vouched for Jimmy, stating he was the patient's brother and knew what to do. Hearing this, Dr. Laura used a remote to turn off the light and then asked Jimmy what was going on. Just as Jimmy was about to explain, he realized everyone still had their electronic devices on them. He hurriedly collected the devices and placed them in a bag by the door. Only then did Jimmy have a moment to ask what had happened. Dr. Laura provided a brief overview of the situation. Jimmy scolded Laura for not calling him directly. Laura explained that the only contact information they had was a business card for HHM. So they contacted Howard first. This showed Jimmy standing in his brother's eyes. Laura recommended that Chuck undergo a 30-day psychiatric evaluation. Hearing this, Chuck gradually regained his composure, insisting he couldn't stay there and explaining his condition to Laura. Chuck realized Laura was diagnosing him with a mental issue and vehemently argued against it to avoid being taken to see a psychiatrist. At this point, Laura walked to the end of the bed and asked Chuck how he managed daily life with his symptoms. 
then secretly turned on an electrical device. Kim and Jimmy watched closely, Chuck didn't sense the electromagnetic field, proving his condition was indeed psychological. Laura requested to speak with Jimmy privately. As Jimmy was leaving, Chuck pleaded with him to take him home. Jimmy remarked that Lara's tactic was quite underhanded, but Lara explained it was necessary to diagnose Chuck's condition accurately and recommended he see a psychiatrist. Jimmy claimed he had already taken Chuck to see the best psychiatrists in the world, but nothing worked. Although Jimmy insists that he took meticulous care of Chuck, in her view, Jimmy was enabling Chuck's behavior. Making Chuck use kerosene lamps at home could easily cause a fire, and with no communication devices in his house, it is extremely dangerous. Jimmy was left speechless by Lara's critique. He saw Kim's opinion, and she also suggested Chuck should receive proper treatment. However, seeing his brother's suffering, Jimmy ultimately decided to take Chuck home. Just then, Howard arrived. Despite the recent tension between him and Jimmy, they agreed on how to handle Chuck's situation. Howard said he had spoken with the district attorney and refused to sign any papers admitting Chuck to the hospital. Jimmy, ever suspicious, immediately saw through Howard's true intentions. Jimmy remarked that Howard didn't want Chuck diagnosed with a psychological condition because it would make Jimmy his guardian, giving him the power to remove Chuck's shares from HHM something Howard definitely didn't want. Howard, feigning innocence, accused Jimmy of overthinking and insisted he was only concerned for Chuck's well-being. Jimmy threatened to hospitalize his brother and thanked Howard for the reminder. Kim quickly ran after them, also believing that Jimmy shouldn't use Chuck's illness to threaten Howard. Jimmy admitted he just wanted to make things difficult for Howard, but he still planned to take Chuck home. The first thing Chuck did when he got home was ask Jimmy to bring him the space blanket. Though reluctant, Jimmy complied. This showed that deep down, Chuck still rejected Jimmy. Jimmy noticed the newspaper on the table and realized Chuck's relapse was triggered by seeing his front page news. But Chuck refused to admit this and didn't want to argue. Jimmy bluntly stated that he put up the billboard solely for advertising. Nothing more. As a seasoned lawyer, Chuck knew advertising was legal and had no rebuttal. Jimmy explained that it had brought him business and promised never to revert to his old self, adding that he intended to specialize in elder law. Seeing Jimmy's sincerity, Chuck gradually let go of the space blanket. Although Chuck didn't verbally acknowledge his psychological issues, his actions betrayed him. The next day at the nursing home, the elderly residents found Jimmy's ad under their jelly cups. Need a will? Call Jimmy McGill. Jimmy, in a friendly white suit, introduced himself to the nursing home residents and warmly greeted each one. It's worth noting that this nursing home was also where Hector stayed in Breaking Bad. In the evening, Jimmy returned home from work, bringing enough stickers and giving Mike a business card. Jimmy didn't directly say Mike was elderly, demonstrating his high emotional intelligence. This business card set the stage for future plot developments. The next storyline naturally shifted to Mike's side. After his night shift, Mike went to a diner, looking troubled. This diner was a regular spot for Mike. In Breaking Bad, after Gus's death, Lydia met with Mike here, pretending not to know him, while the waitress was clearly familiar with Mike. Then Mike came to his daughter-in-law Stacy's doorstep, but they didn't talk when Stacy saw Mike. There seemed to be a deep rift between them. When Mike got home, he was drinking a beer and watching TV when he suddenly saw a shadow pass by the window. Instinctively, he turned off the TV. A knock followed. Mike grabbed a baseball bat for protection and peeked through the peephole. It was an old acquaintance. Mike put down the bat and opened the door to find his former colleagues from Philadelphia. They were there about Mike's son. Long way from home, aren't you? You and me both. 